Welcome to Mining the Media, providing nuggets of news and cutting-edge questions and answers, minus the political blather. Here are your hosts, G.K. Allen and Dave Jeffers. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Mining the Media podcast. I'm Dave Jeffers, the producer and co-host. That's G.K. Allen up there. He's our creator and co-host, and we are excited to welcome back for the first our first welcome back or return guest, Rod Martin. And uh, we didn't get to hook up in Nashville. I, I missed Rod and Miss Sherry, but we were there. And I, our last podcast was kind of my points of view of what I saw as a guest and just a first time observer. But we want to get somebody that knows how the sausage is made. So we brought Rod back and he's going to give us the down low. So GK, I'm going to hand it off to you to throw the first fastball at him. Well, the advantage I have in a way is I'm, I'm, I'm really not well versed on the subject because I wasn't brought up in this particular faith. So allow me to ask, what exactly is a Southern Baptist Convention? Well, the Southern Baptist Convention, and I serve on the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. So, so you're right. I know a lot about sausage making at this point. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Um, arguably a lot more than just the United States, with about 14 million members in uh, roughly 50,000 churches, uh, depending on how you count it, and um, obviously somewhat more concentrated in the southern part of the United States than the rest of the country, but with churches in all 50 states and, and Canada and parts of the Caribbean as well. We normally, outside the United States, encourage churches there to join or create, depending, uh, local national conventions, because our church polity is such that we believe in the autonomy of the local church. It's the local church that is actually the church. The denominational structure, unlike in Catholicism or Anglicanism or Methodism or whatever, the denominational structure has no authority over local churches in Baptist life. The denominational structure merely exists to pool the money that independent local churches give through what we call the cooperative program and other special offerings for the purpose of doing tasks that we can do better together than we can do separately. So for instance, we have six Southern Baptist seminaries that collectively educate one third of all the seminary students on the North American continent, which is a staggering number when you consider that we only make up about one eleventh of the churches in North America, but we are we are educating one third of the seminarians in North America. Uh, likewise, we have the largest missionary force in evangelical Christendom. So, so it's an enormous organization of churches voluntarily giving through the cooperative program and other means to support seminary education missionaries both here and abroad, and of course other things like, for instance, Guidestone Financial Services has the pension money. Well, they're an incredibly well-run fund, and they have almost $30 billion under management. Uh, Lifeway Christian Stores, and they've gone entirely online now, but that's part of the Southern Baptist Convention too, and, and so on and so forth. So enormous organization, enormously culturally relevant, even if you aren't a believer. And so, needless to say, a target for leftist infiltration and, and uh, co-opting. Now, you mentioned abroad. Where are you having your most success beyond the borders of North America? Well, the International Mission Board is in virtually every part of the world. And some of those places have to be uh, a little bit hidden because missionaries aren't permitted there for one reason or another. But you mean like uh, was, Red China? Like Red China. But um, a, a member of my staff, actually, uh, as a young girl, smuggled Bibles into China past the Red Guards and, and uh, took her life in her hands, all five foot three of her, and, you know, at the time about 18 years of age and did it a couple of times. So we have a bona fide hero of the faith right here in the office. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that sort of thing that goes on around the world. But um, it, it really, the gospel is going out everywhere. It, it's really staggering. And in the past several decades, we've seen explosive growth in Latin America, certainly in South Korea, which is now almost 50% Christian. 
um, places like Indonesia, which is largely Muslim, but but you see tremendous growth of the church there, parts of Southeast Asia. India is beginning to, to really see a lot of uh, steam pick up as far as penetration of the gospel. There's actually a, a state in the extreme far east of India that is now largely Christian. It's a very small state in a very large country, but, but nevertheless, uh, extraordinary things happening around the world. We're seeing some tremendous successes in the Middle East. And, and of course, Africa. So it's a, it, it's really a fascinating time. It's a tremendously productive time for the spread of the gospel. Christianity does remain the largest uh, faith in the entire world, and the evangelical component of that is growing expeditiously. Uh, but at the same time, as you know, Western civilization it, it seems to be taking a bit of a left turn, and we see. Uh, a growing number of the so-called nuns in the United States, by which I do not mean women who wear a habit. I mean, people who identify, you know, you know, what is your religion? And they answer none. And uh, so that's actually, I think, more of an opportunity than not. I think there were a lot of people who identified as Christian in the United States for several decades who really weren't. They just culturally belonged to a church. Their parents went, so they went. Uh, maybe that's very similar to... Uh, coming from, uh, I was raised Lutheran. Uh, my mom, Protestant, my father, Jewish. My father was an agnostic or an atheist, depending upon when you ask him. He felt I needed to have a mainstream religion in my life, and I give him credit for that. And that's what I was raised. I was raised as a Protestant and uh, became a Quaker when I was a teenager. The thing that I find very disturbing right now uh, whatever your version of Christianity is, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, whether you're just a cultural Christian or more involved, is that the American media seems to have nothing but contempt and narrow-minded views for anybody who is a Jew or a Christian. Their attitude is unbelievable. Things they would never do to a Muslim or say about a Muslim or present to a Muslim, they will to someone who's a Protestant or a Catholic or a Jew. Yes, our cultural elites have unshakable dogmatic beliefs in many, many things that are utterly unprovable, making them, oh wait, a religion. And they are absolutely intolerant of any other faith, such as all of the other faiths. And uh, none so much as Christianity, because Christianity, as it has for all of time, makes absolute claims that God actually is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place to atone for our sins, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, but that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. So they just hate that, and they hate that he represents an independent source of moral authority and right and wrong that they can't modify because Nancy Pelosi pulls together a, a joint committee and, and passes something in a smoke-filled room. That absolutely infuriates the left as it has since Stalin and Marx and for that matter, Pharaoh, and that ain't going to change. So we do have a bit of a battle on our hands right now because the American left has become consistent with the international left in violent acts, as we see across the country this past year, and in their willingness to subvert the system to remake it in their own image. Okay, you just teed me up with what you just said. I figured. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. And, and this is what I saw at the convention. And this is what I've been seeing in the church for 20 years now, probably definitely the last eight to 10 is the gospel is counterculture. It Jesus is. was counterculture. It is an exclusive faith. Now it should not be arrogant. I've been accused of, of having an arrogant and an exclusive faith. And I said, you got it half right. Half the right. Faith itself is exclusive. The arrogance will come from people who are all acting like Christ would act. Christ never act arrogant. He was very strong. 
But the problem we have with the churches, and I think this is how critical race theory has crept up into it. We had to go through this in the late 70s, early 80s with the conservative resurgence, is we're trying to be culturally relevant. We're trying to make the gospel relevant. And what I tell everybody is the gospel is always relevant. The challenge is to make it relative, show people why it matters. Whenever anybody brings something up to me, I always get back to the Bible. I actually had somebody say, why is it every time you reply in an email, there's something about the, God, about the Bible in there? I said, because that's where the answers are. And, 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 you know, my pastor always said, he said this last Sunday at church, he goes, and it goes to what Greg said, when something goes wrong, you don't see any pastors being called up. You don't see the church being called up. You don't see the church, the media, or anybody coming to the, the one denomination or even local churches who can make a difference, who can mobilize immediately. And, and why is it that we are trying to be culturally relevant when we should be culturally relative? And I think that's a distinction with a huge difference. Well, you said it very well at the outset that Christianity is inherently countercultural. And that seems a bit foreign to some of our people today because they're so used to Western civilization being rooted right. in Christian thought that now that so many of our cultural leaders and so much of the culture behind them have abandoned any pretense of that and have adopted a, a neo-Marxian worldview that, that is explicitly just filled with loathing for Christianity. They think somehow they're going to play nice with these people and they're going to like them better somehow. I got news for you. Jesus told us they will hate you because they first hated me. And the hate is well-founded. They're in rebellion against everything, he says, and his very being. The idea that there could be a creator is countercultural. The idea that he could have any exclusive claims to declare what is right and wrong is just anathema to people. And, and the idea, crucially, that they might be fallen, sinful people who need forgiveness and redemption is just utterly offensive to everyone's pride. And I know this very well because I'm one of them. It offended me. It offended my pride. But I learned very, very well that Jesus Christ alone is true and faithful and able to save. And, and when you bow the knee to Jesus, you find your, your true calling and power and ability to make a difference in the world. Not that they aren't making a difference in the world, but what they're building is a nightmare, a dystopian future that we've tried and tried in the past. If you want to see where they're going, just look at Venezuela now or Cuba now or the Soviet Union before or the Cultural Revolution in, in China in the 60s and 70s. Antifa has already been tried. That was the communist equivalent of the brown shirts in Germany in the 20s and 30s. And this iteration of Antifa and BLM acts exactly like the Red Guards in China in the 60s and 70s. There's nothing new under this sun. So we have seen their future, and it doesn't work. It enslaved half the world. It murdered 100 million people in, in the century, uh, less than a century, between 1917 and 1991. And why on earth would we go back to such a nightmare? And we need to go beyond religion, uh, in a sense, because Dave knows, and I may have said it to you, Rod, earlier, uh, my greatest passion politically right now is to make sure that our First Amendment still works and continues to work. And that allows people to be religious or agnostic. It allows them to be liberal or conservative. And what really, really bothers me now is the level of intolerance on the part of so many who I look at it this way, and, 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 and just bear with me for a moment. A lot of people voted against Donald Trump. They didn't vote for Joe Biden. Right. They voted against Donald Trump because they didn't like his personality. They thought he was coarse, whatever. They were overlooking policy that worked. 
where we had black people with the lowest unemployment rate in modern times, uh, Hispanic, very low unemployment rate, women, very low unemployment rate, very reasonable gas prices, and the economy was booming until the Chinese did what I believe they did deliberately, decided to stick it to the Western world. And I, I think right now we have to realize and I wish more people on our side would start the fight a bit more. The First Amendment really does matter. If America goes away, as we know it, it's going to take our place. I don't want Venezuela taking our place or Russia or China. And I think the world, frankly, and one giant bill to the Chinese communists for what they did to the world when Antarctica even got COVID you know something serious going on. And the Chinese oh, yeah. really stuck it to the world and continue to do it. And in the Democrat Party, we still have an awful lot of people. And sadly, it seems, in some of our military, we have a lot of people who aren't really patriotic. Oh, indeed. And, and you know, coming back to the First Amendment, you know, and, and some of your listeners might not have brushed up on their First Amendment recently. So, you know, let's be clear, that's, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. So, and of course, freedom of association. So you have a set of ideas that never existed in the world before America, never existed outside of Christendom at all. These are things that Christians came up with because Christians come from a completely different ethos than, you know, you shall bow to Caesar or we will put you to death. You know, this is just, or, or for that matter, the Spanish Inquisition. You know, there was a long, long medieval period in which people had not outgrown those modes of thinking, just as we didn't outgrow slavery for a very long time, or before that, polygamy for a very long time. But a mature Christian civilization was able to say, wait, you know, regardless of what you think about Calvinism versus traditionalism, the essence of the Great Commission is persuasion. Right. Now, God could just make everybody a Christian today, but God actually sends individual believers to reason with and persuade even, even Paul on Mars Hill goes goes and reasons with the Athenian philosophers. This is a completely different way of handling things than, for instance, Islam conquering North Africa by the sword and making everybody a Muslim. So this kind of thinking leads you to the ideas in the First Amendment. But those ideas are anathema to a totalitarian system. And when they're blatantly calling themselves socialists and those who know Spanish, and I, I don't remember if you speak Spanish, Greg, but uh, it is, but I have a number of staff members who do, and they assure me that the slogans you hear coming out of the self proclaimed democratic socialists here, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, any of them you wish to name, are verbatim, word for word, identical to what you heard from Castro yeah. in the 50s and early 60s and ongoing. From, from Maduro, from Chavez, from all these guys. And, and it's the same revolution. It is the same aim, and it will have the same end. They and I should point out, Rod, it. that I, I speak menu. Oh, okay. Cafe you con leche, poquito azúcar. Well, you know, Rod. I, I speak taco and, and <laughs> <pavita>. <laughs> you, you know, Rod, the, um, the First Amendment, and, 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 the, and what you're talking about how through the years, Marxism has spelled. Um, I can't remember who wrote it, but it was in the recent Imprimus that talked about the genesis of critical race theory. We all know it came out of the Harvard Law School, but the reason behind it was because Marxism has failed. You can't sell that. You can't openly sell Marxism. So They've had to come up with a whole, I mean, in the 90s, it was, oh, well, we just didn't do it right. We need more social justice. We need more um, compassionate conservatism. It's all socialism. It's all Marxism. So they came up with the critical race theory, and that's how they inject the Marxist, because it is Marxism. That's all it is. 
But to go back to the First Amendment, and we're going to have Bill Federer on next week for a Fourth of July special, and um, he'll be our second returning guest. But when you go back and look at the genesis of the First Amendment, you go back and read all the founders, the ultimate, the utmost was freedom of religion. Yes. And then because they, yeah, and because they knew to be truly free, then you have to be free to have opposing views and to be able to express them nonviolently. Okay. So that's why me and GK are so big on the First Amendment. I know you are too. But I want to go back to the Southern Baptist Convention. I heard an interesting proposal, and I'm sure you've heard it. And my pastor said he would be in favor of it in, if, under only one condition. And that is, let the woke in Southern Baptist Convention become the Great Commission Conference and go off their little merry way and let the Southern Baptist Convention, the conservatives, stay the Southern Baptist Convention. And he said, I'd be all for that, but you'd have to split the seminaries in half and Southwestern has to go to the woke. <laughs> well, he came from there. Say, he was an adjunct professor for a while there. Needless to say, they have no interest in that at all, because as it stands, with lots of conservative churches not understanding where they stand in this, what their own position is, and what the mechanisms of, of controlling these entities are, they're talking about leaving many of them, and right. all they're going to do is hand all these institutions to the people they oppose, Right, which is just completely crazy. So actually, the SBC works very simply. I said at the outset, this is not a denomination in the sense we're used to thinking of, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans. There's no hierarchy. It is purely the, the mechanisms by which a lot of independent churches pool money to do specific tasks, whether it's seminary education or running a pension fund or, or you know, sending missionaries, whatever it may be. So what we have is a group of trustee boards, and they run all of those institutions. Those are indirectly appointed by a president. Now, the president has a one-year term, and he is customarily reelected for a second one-year term, Though, of course, I heard a lot from the platform about how custom and tradition doesn't matter anymore right. from our more left-wing friends. So I don't really have any qualms whatsoever about running a candidate against Ed Litton next year in Anaheim because his people tell me that mm -hmm. custom doesn't matter. Okay, fair enough. But normally, an SBC president has two years, and he has two shots, therefore, to completely appoint something called the Committee on Committees. Only Baptists could have something called a committee on committees, but we do. And that body appoints a committee on nominations. The idea being that the president has a huge say in this, but does not get to directly pick the committee on nominations. That committee on nominations fills all of the boards of the entities. In, and, you know, the messengers get to vote on that, but they pretty much adopt this enormous book length report Right. of the Committee on Nominations, and there's very little time for debate on that. So pretty much the convention rubber stamps what the Committee on Nominations does. So indirectly, the president appoints all those boards, and the board members normally have about a four-year term, and they're normally reelected for a second four-year term. So it takes several years to replace the Board of Southern Seminary or the Board of the International Mission Board. But at the same time, that's exactly how the conservative resurgence worked. Right. And it's exactly what the left is doing now. J.D. Greer, because of COVID, got three years instead of two. So he's had three shots at filling board seats. Now, Ed Litton's going to get at least one year. So that's a total of four. And if he gets his second term, that's a total of five. That's enough to flip the majority on every board. Maybe not enough to start firing entity heads and replacing them, but maybe enough. So, so conservatives can play that game too and did successfully in the 80s. And if conservative churches just woke up and realized every last one of them is entitled to at least two messengers without sending a penny 
And if they're giving to the cooperative program or even just giving to, you know, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which is entirely for international missionaries and, you know, or Annie Armstrong, which is for, for North American missionaries. If, if they give to any of those things, they're entitled to even more messengers up to a total of 12. So a mega church, you know, can't have any more than 12 and a small church could easily have 12 if they just want to. And that means that, the overwhelming majority of Southern Baptist churches, which are overwhelmingly conservative, just have to show up at one lousy meeting a year and they run the table. And it's really, really simple. You just have to understand how it works and go. This isn't complex. And this year, when we knew we were running against a woke candidate for president, who, who's a pastor over here in Mobile, uh, Ed Litton, we knew we were running against a woke guy. We knew that the woke people were behind it. Okay, fine. We doubled the number of messengers compared to any recent prior year. Record turnout for the last 25 years, and we only lost that presidential vote by, by a few hundred votes. If we had flipped 300 votes, Mike Stone would be president. So we've proven we can win. We just have to go do it. I have a question about that. And me and that's another thing me and my pastor talked about. And actually a bunch of us talked about it at lunch. How many actual messengers, because I didn't go into this, the second session and the, uh, the first day I had gone. Um, I was there on the first morning and I'll tell you what, at 30 minute point, I was, I was filled. I was done. You know what it reminded me of? Many <laughs> we'll of our We'll have to help you do that better next time. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had, you know, I had flashbacks of the NFRA as your sergeant at arms. And, <laughs> and, and I was telling them. With the thousands last, more people. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I told them at the last show, I said, this, this is a political mechanism they use. Not that it's bad, but don't, most people don't understand that. Because I was watching people around me, all these young, these old sweet people who come for the first time. They didn't understand what was going on. And me and my pastor, I'm like, he can't, JD can't do that. He was great. I mean, if you have a parliamentarian and you're using Robert's rule, it's a political mechanism. And I understand that's what you got to have to run a, a, a convention. But you better follow the rules. And they didn't. And let me give you my ex, my comparison, because it reminded me of the had a very good parliamentarian and a bad president. I know we had. I had so many flashbacks, but here's what I saw. J.D. Greer is the Baptist convention. Uh, example or comparison of Mitt Romney. <laughs> and here's why well, I, I say think that. you may be giving him credit. Well, here's why I'm saying that. <laughs> here's why I'm saying that. Because he's very charismatic, very yeah. likable, yes. and will smile at you as he's taking your wallet, placing a <laughs> knife through the sh a shiv into your back. I mean, he was unbelievably slick i mean beyond yeah. slick and very I, was just, I, I couldn't take no more rod but anyway here, get back to my main point so we have lunch karen and i go into the exhibit hall i wanted to go by liberty and go see my university da 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 well we're sitting and all these messengers are swim streaming in i mean there had to be we sat and watched there had to be 500 new people showing up so my question is did Everybody that went there as a messenger get to vote because of the way the voting was. It was by paper and you had to put it in it. Why not machines? If, if the Trump vote did get stolen and machines are trustworthy, why won't the Southern Baptist Convention use machines? And why can't messengers register, vote from their home churches, stream it because a lot of people aren't going to be able to make it to Anaheim. Why can't we do that? Why would they ever be against that? Well, first you would have to have a constitutional change okay. that, that was not made. So it right. will not be in place for Anaheim. Right. Um, and second, I have been preaching against the dangers of machine voting for 30 years. They're inherently corruptible. Right. You could, I have seen video of five-year-olds hacking voting machines. Right. It is ridiculous. So we really don't want that. There are some proposals for remote voting that could be viable, but someone would have to champion them and they'd have to be passed. Actually, 
probably, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but I think that would actually have to be uh, done by two consecutive annual meetings to make a change of that kind. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. But, but to, the, to the immediate question of did they all get to vote, everybody got to vote who was in the room. That's and a lot of people did leave. And that happens every year because people aren't paying close attention. Please be sure to check out part two of Rod Martin's interview on mining the media.